All right, we just have um, a minute or so to introduce our guest. You've been listening to Activist Radio. Um, our guest today is uh, Felicia Eves. She's a longtime human rights advocate. She's the co-chair of the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights, and she's a coordinator for the American Muslims for Palestine. And we have a, I, I thought, really interesting uh, talk um, about Black Lives Matter and Palestinian liberation, and the long-standing solidarity between those two groups, you know, going back to the uh, 1960s. So um, let's uh, prepare for that. Uh, we'll put Felicia Eves on uh, Activist Radio, and let's go to that interview. All right, Felicia Eves longtime human rights advocate, former co-chair of the steering committee of the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights. Thank you so much for taking your time uh, to be on Activist Radio today. Well, thank you so much, Fred, for inviting me. Um, this is an honor to be here and to share um, and have conversation with your audience and listeners this morning. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, the... Uh, we might as well just jump right into it. Uh, is the fight for racial justice, is it an international one? Um, or is it restricted to the, well, the obvious mistreatment, a long history of mistreatment of people of color in the U.S.? Is it one of the oh, others? Or is it a mixture of both or what? No, absolutely not. I mean, it's, it, it is an international um, issue. And... You know, over the years, the United States has become so insular um, that I think we forget that um, there are these kinds of injustices around the world. And, you know, as we're talking about Palestine today in particular, I mean, that is one of the um, instances where, you know, Palestinians have been, um, you know, discriminated against horribly um, by the Israeli government. Um, with our with the United States support, so you know, this is one of the issues that I've been passionate about for the last almost 20 years now. And so, but I also think you know we're seeing these kinds of things around the world. Um, you know, this past summer there was protest in Nigeria. Um, you know, there's still protests with Muslims, um, the Uyghurs in in China. Um, so, you know, this, uh, the issue of racial discrimination and, and racial oppression um, is an issue, an international issue that I think we all should not just be aware of, but take up the mantle and, and try to fight as hard for uh, uh, racial equity um, and harmony around the world as we do here in the United States. I see. And does, uh, for example... Looking at the history of apartheid in South Africa, does that help us understand, uh, well, the, the Jim Crow segregation we've seen here in the U.S., the history of it as well? Are, are there ways to link those histories, and is that an advantageous thing to do? Absolutely. Um, as you know, um, here in the United States, um, many people took up uh, and, and became in solidarity with South, the South African people, black, the black South Africans there during the uh, the days of the, apart the anti-apartheid movement. And as we have, um, as a Palestinian rights organizer and, and, and solidarity worker, um, you know, one of the things that we look to was how um, organizers and, and people went through the issue of, of, of dismantling apartheid in, in South Africa to inform mm. our work in trying to dismantle the apartheid system in Israel. And we're still working on that. Um, that's that's a, it's a thorny one. But also, I mean, South African apartheid lasted for many years as well, as we all know. You know, to, uh, Nelson Mandela was in jail for 27 years before he was was uh, freed from jail. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, these movements take a long time. And, you know, we are going into, you know, you know, several generations here in the United States 
of dealing with anti-black racial part, you know, racial uh, uh, discrimination. And now it's being mixed in with uh, Islamophobia against uh, Muslim mm-hmm. Americans. Um, also, as well as now, you know, as the we've been going through this pandemic, we're, we're now seeing um, up, upticks in um, anti-Asian um, uh, racial violence. So, mm-hmm. but but this is part of, unfortunately, part of America's history that we all need to take account for, not just be aware of, but take account for and try to dismantle it wherever we see it. In in some ways, uh, the U.S. seems to be expanding its military, especially in Africa with AFRICOM. And now there's new studies that show how many wars we're fighting in Africa itself and how many bases we have all over Africa. Um, what is the U.S. doing in Africa? What, why this sudden military interest? Um uh, or is that beyond the, the sort of the purview of uh, Palestinian rights? I think I think it's also you know the continuum of of looking at you know um, I also was you know what how I got into the issue of of the Palestinian rights movement was through the um, anti uh, war movement that took place during the Iraq War days and you know um, as we huh. know. Many of, you know, it's it's the fight for resources. So in Africa, you know, Africa is one of those last bastion of, of, of resources that they haven't quite been able to get to as, as much as they have in other places like the Middle East. And so mm-hmm. I think, you know, um, and it's also kind of an entryway to other countries also. Um, so, you know, I think the reason why there are so many bases in Africa is because, you know, the United States is wanting to glom on to those resources because, for example, we are, um, as far as oil, we are kind of nearing our uh, supply um, in terms mm-hmm. of, of that. And and because of the, the great work that people have been doing, for example, with the XL pipeline and all of that, um, and Standing Rock, you know, um, and, and different places in terms of, of the environmental work that a lot of people have been doing, um, you know, it's been harder for the imperialist powers that be to get a hold mm. of the resources that they've been that they've been used to getting a hold of. So now they're just, you know, trying to go to other places that they think are more vulnerable. And unfortunately, you know, a lot of the governments in Africa are still very unstable. And so it's been easy to kind of manipulate um, those governments in some ways to get in. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm hoping that, you know, those the, the people in those countries will rise up as well. And, um, you know, as particularly as the global movement for climate against climate change happens, you know, and um Fortunately, we're the United States um, has been, you know, re-entered in back into the Paris Accord. You know, mm. maybe that will help in terms of, right. of, you know, getting us back on track with that and getting the United States out of some of these countries that they don't belong in in the first place. Mm. Mm. Yeah, because uh, sometimes military bases really don't bring anything like democracy. And in some ways, it's the exact opposite. You mentioned Standing Rock, and I'm interested in uh, the American uh, Indian, you know, movement. And um, mm-hmm. are there links? Uh, there were links back in the late 1960s, right, between uh, the Panther Party and uh, the American Indian movement. Uh, what are those links like today? And was there uh, a number of people who went to Standing Rock who were resent? who were representing people of color uh, fighting the Absolutely. pipeline. Absolutely. Uh, I think, you know, um, since Ferguson happened uh, uh, with the death of, of Mike Brown by police um, in Ferguson, I think we've seen a resurgence of multiracial, multigenerational, and multi-movement um, solidarity on all levels. 
And I am good friends with a, a woman by the name of, of Judith, um, uh, uh, who has been um, uh, working with Standing Rock. Um, and she, uh, you know, the, the, the people there, um, when that was all happening, um, they, you know, it was, it was a cause to get everybody together in terms of solidarity, not only around mm um uh indian you know the the issue of native american issues but the climate change folks came um into that so i think you know we are seeing a, a surge just like you mentioned in the 1960s with the american indian movement and the black panther movement or the black black power movement i think we're seeing a resurgence of people understanding that our struggles are common um, and that if we don't come together and um, and be in solidarity and not just be in solidarity with each other, but also just understand that because our struggles are, are common to each other and there mm -hmm. is a war <laughs> against um, those of us who don't uh, represent the uh, white supremacist power structure. I see. Um, you know, I think, you know, we have come to understand that um, we have to take up arms with each other, link arms with each other, and, and, and come together. And that, you know, that includes our white allies, because mm -hmm. um, over this last summer, we saw a, a huge surge of white allies coming um, together with the movement for Black Lives um, during the uprisings that happened in Minnesota and Washington, D.C. and all over the world. So, I mean, and that's encouraging because I think, um, you know, white people need to understand their role and, and accept their, accept some accountability in, in their, mm -hmm. in their role in this, you know, in terms of the, the privilege that they have and using that privilege, privilege to leverage against um, the mm -hmm. discrimination that we have been, that people of color have been experiencing for, you know, for eons <laughs> sure there was an interesting link um <clears throat> uh, i went out with the veterans to standy rock and um mm -hmm. sometimes they would call all we had i don't know how many uh, there are thousands of veterans out there um and there were a lot of uh, lakota veterans so many that uh when i talked to them they readily admitted uh, yes you know, since the service is one way in the, you know, segregated racist society that we can actually uh, get ourselves out of poverty. And the Lakota themselves, they call themselves a warrior people. Um, but that's also true of black Americans, right? I mean, in the early part of the Vietnam War, you know, so many of the U.S. troops were black. Lots of black people see the U.S. military as a way to uh, get out of poverty or even a, to escape racism. So there's some interesting connections, I think, between, you know, uh, Native American rights and, and black, uh, the rights of black Americans. Um, what are the forces that, that you see that are working against, you know, broadening this focus? Who... Who is resisting, uh, you know, black liberation movements from broadening their focus? Well, I think it's, it's you know, of course, it's the white supremacist power structure that includes our, you know, our government. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the fact that we are having to fight for things like a living wage and fight for housing and fight for things that are are uh, important for human survival and and those are put on a scale of deserving in terms of, you know what in terms of looking at you know who deserves to live and who doesn't and mm -hmm. that and then that is based on race and class um i think that's where we are getting the resistance um you know i think um uh, you know this the divide that we're seeing in terms of of conservatives versus liberals, but also just the 
I think just the divide that we're seeing in terms of what people believe, the beliefs that we have in this country around who gets what. And, mm -hmm. you know, people believing that, well, you know, th these old tropes and beliefs that people have that, well, if you're not doing, you're not working hard and doing what is needed, then you don't deserve it. When there is a power structure that is keeping um, the very necessities away from us um, mm -hmm. and away from the very poor. And I actually happen to live in Kentucky right now. And, you know, it's very interesting to me <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I was born here, but I never really lived here. And so living here has been very eye opening to the fact that, you know, white people will still vote against their own self interest in terms of mm -hmm. the necessities that they need in order to keep um, their privilege intact. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we just saw um, uh, uh, a Senate, former Senate leader, uh, Mitch McConnell get reelected by the people of Kentucky mm. when he hasn't really done anything for the state. I mean, the state is, is on the list of, you know, in terms of poverty and educational attainment. I mean, we're kind of, we're just above Mississippi in those, in those areas. Um, and although uh, our governor has been fabulous, he is a democratic governor. He's been fabulous, fabulous in terms of dealing with, uh, the coronavirus um, situation mm -hmm. here, but he's caught hell trying to keep people um, safe because there are people who believe that, mm -hmm. you know, he is the cause of, you know, businesses not being open because of the regulations that he has imposed in trying to keep people safe from the virus. Um, mm -hmm. He was even taken to the Supreme Court by our um, uh, attorney general, who happens to be a black man. He's the first black man to be an attorney general in the state of Kentucky. And yet he's working against his own community um, to satisfy his Republican um, uh, house. So, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, wow. it, it's been crazy. <laughs> it's, been, it's been crazy. So I think with that, you know, the, 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 it, you know, racism and the, the issue of white supremacy, it's, it's, it's a weird kind of thing where people will do things against, I mean, people, white people who are most vulnerable will work against their own self-interest economically and socially to mm. keep this lie, this, this lie about, you know, having privilege alive. And yeah. I think what a lot of, um, uh, poor white folks don't understand is that you're not in the same class as Donald Trump in terms of money mm. and influence. And voting him into office is not going to get you into that class club through osmosis. And I think that's what a lot of them thought was going to happen or and still mm. think is going to happen because yeah, right. you know, we you all know. <laughs> wear the same red hats and therefore we're all on the same team. In some ways it's, America is amazingly ignorant about its racist past. I mean, yeah. the idea that racism has been with us for so long and and politicians, um, you know, have run on racism, you know, blatant racism for decades and maybe mm -hmm. hundred, hundreds of years. Uh, I'm reading a book called uh, uh, The Kidnap Gang in New York City, 1830s, and how the New York Police Department was kidnapping mostly free blacks and sending them back to the South and then collecting the money, uh, you know, selling them back into slavery. Right. This is the New York Police Department. So, you know, people are always surprised. How can the New York Police Department be so racist? I mean, where? how did it happen? But, you know, 18, 1830s, they were doing stuff, maybe even worse stuff than they're doing now. You know, racism is just part of American society, and maybe exactly. being a white in this country means that you uh, are somehow blind, <laughs> blind to the racism. But it's been it's been here for so long. Maybe that's part of you know liberation is for us all to understand what what our history you know really has been. Um, Absolutely. What do you, Absolutely. 
What do yeah. you think of uh, we have these new revelations about Malcolm X's murder, you know, the FBI involved and um, getting his security arrested uh, right before his assassination. There's film on, uh, you know, Fred Hampton's murder in Chicago. Yes. There seems yes. to be a little flash of uh, uh, revelation as far as the state using violence against uh, black leaders. Where is this coming from, do you think? Or is this part of uh, the new um, white-black alliance? Well, I think, you know, I actually uh, just watched the Netflix. Um, there's a documentary on Netflix called uh, Who Killed Malcolm X? And it's all about a man who I believe lives actually in Washington, D.C. Or, or the Washington, D.C. area who has taken up uh, as a part of a passion project um, for years to figure out mm -hmm. who killed Malcolm X. Mm. And so this revelation about the FBI being part of it, um, you know, it confirms some of the things that he um, found. But, you know, I think it's, 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 it's been part and parcel. It's part and parcel of the whole idea that, um, you know, white supremacy means that someone has to be on top. And, you mm. know, as soon as, you know, someone comes in like a Dr. Martin Luther King or a Malcolm X and tries to, um, first of all, you know, enlighten people about what is happening at the, at the government and, and, you know, at that level mm -hmm. of, of authority, um, people get scared. Because, you know, there's great profit in, in what the government has been doing. And there's been great profit in keeping other people mm -hmm. out of, uh, out of you know, being, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the equitable, uh, prosper, prosperous cycle. So um, they don't want people to know that. And, they, and, mm -hmm. and as white supremacy goes, you know, you don't want other people to get a hold or or to come to to um, take your place on top. So I think, mm. you know, they had to get rid of people like Malcolm X and and um, uh, Martin Luther King and, and dismantle the entire uh, Black Panther, mm. Panther Party because the truth was getting out to the point that a lot of people were listening. And, and mm. I mean, it's just like now, you know, people are listening, people are understanding and mm. The, the scales are coming off of people's eyes. Yeah. And so, you know, they don't want that to happen because that would, that would dismantle everything that they have, they have taken centuries mm. to build yeah. and to keep themselves on top. So, yeah. yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's just, you know, I mean, if we look back at all of the many um, slave rebellions that happened back during um, the time of, of, you know, when people were enslaved and black people were enslaved, mm -hmm. there were many slave, uh, slave rebellions that happened that um, we've never heard of. Sure. So I think, you know, it's a testament to the fact that, you know, people who have been in social and political and economic bondage have not wanted to be there and they've always fought to try to, to get their freedom. But also mm -hmm. the people who are who who have kept them in bondage are not going to want to let that go. They don't want that Absolutely. power. It's a power structure. You know, it's a power struggle. Yeah. So they don't want to to um, to give up that power. And I think, you know, as we're seeing demographic shifts, you know, um, particularly, you know, in in people of color, like the, for example, the, you know, the Latino population is gaining, gaining ground in terms of mm -hmm. population. Um, black people are, are gaining ground in terms of population. And there are more people coming um, to the United States who are not white. And for the first time in, in history, we're seeing a downturn in, in um, white life expectancy. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, there's a fear there that, you know, sure. what, what, um, the Trump administration, you know, make America great again, it's really just a, a code for keep America white. And exactly. so that's what they're trying to hold on to, that, that yeah. type of power. 
Um, and But it's really sad that they're using um, white people who are the least, who have the least power in terms of that as their base to try to push that. Because in the end, those people are, are going to get pushed to the side. I mean, after yeah. after they get what they want, they're not they're going to use them and throw them away. And it's really sad sure. that they can't see that. Yeah. Well, it's uh, enlightenment comes in in lots of ways. So maybe eventually, um, that idea of uh, we're going to make you somehow um, important because you're white. I mean, maybe yeah. people will start to question that. And uh, uh, I don't really have time to actually ask you my next question. I'm sorry. Well, maybe <laughs> you'll come back at another point. I was going to oh, ask I... you about the use of anti-Semitism, especially against black people like Warnock and, uh, you yeah. know, Senator Warnock and Elon Omar. I mean, um, this assault on you know, calling everything they say anti-Semitic, but we're going to save that for another time. And I want to thank you okay. so much for being on. That was really, really interesting. And we'll put a link to, you know, your most recent uh, uh, program, um, which you. was called, and, uh, and go ahead. It's called Yalla uh, Y'all. And it, yes, it's right. under, yeah, <laughs> And it's um, it was a, a series uh, by that was commissioned by uh, American Muslims for Palestine that mm. I did as a means to try to get more voices um, who have been working on the front lines of Black and Palestinian solidarity to talk about their experiences. And so it's actually an eight part series. So um, if you put the link to uh, American Muslims for Palestine, then they can alert people when the next um, the next episode will be aired. Right, and that they're they're absolutely great. So we're gonna we're gonna have that link on Class Wars when uh, when this airs. So thank you so much for being on Activist Radio. That was really interesting. Well, well thank you so much for having me, and and I'd love to come back again and and great. keep the discussion going.